It's going to happen. That, so that's really the, that encompasses the next 48 hours or so. But what happens when we get close to the states? How strong is that high right there? Is it strong enough to shove it right into Florida? All right, like this. Is it strong enough to bring it just close and then maybe hug the coast, landfall or not? Or is it strong enough to maybe push it south a little bit and then bring it into the Gulf of Mexico? Believe it or not, these are all possible solutions at this stage of the game. The ensemble members have been running with the European model, all 51 of them. You can see that there is spread in the models once we get by uh, the Bahamas, but the most likely clustering actually goes on in here, and that is where the Hurricane Center's cone is at the present time. Remember, this is a landfall cone. This is where they expect the center to possibly pass out per time. And that's, uh, of course, now been delayed this morning. That's the, that's the two, one of the two big changes here. Uh, we're talking about something now on Monday versus Sunday night. And we're also talking about something that's coming in at a bona fide 125 miles per hour. That's the forecast. So they've upped the intensity. And some of the guidance actually goes higher than 125 miles an hour. So the wind field is going to expand. The onset of the tropical storm force winds is going to be potentially as early as Sunday morning for parts of central Florida at present speed and intensity and things like that. And there you can see that from this graphic. Here's 8 a.m. on Sunday. So talking to Ken Graham earlier, he was saying, okay, so you backtrack that 48 hours. And so do we get uh, during the 11 o'clock advisory tomorrow hurricane watches that go up for Florida? It's absolutely possible. All right. Uh, I expect them on Friday. I wouldn't be surprised at all. So it is forecast to become a major hurricane. This is what we know. The threat for hurricane conditions, uh, especially in the Bahamas and eventually Florida, as we head into a holiday weekend. Hard to believe we're actually talking about another Labor Day hurricane for Florida. The last one, of course, was a Cat 5 in 1935. Too soon to pinpoint exactly where the worst conditions are going to be. But if you live anywhere in Florida, expect impacts. All right, because you're going to have them uh, in some way, shape, or form. Does the system slow to potentially flood this area? These are all reasonable questions, but prepare uh, is going to be your best friend right yeah, now. Yeah, yes, for sure. So let's talk more about the questions people have, actually, when preparing for Dorian. We're asking your questions uh, about Dorian or hurricanes in general, really. Yeah. Anything you're wondering about, just tweet us using the hashtag hurricane questions. All right, so we're going to first get our question from Jen. Not this Jen. Another one. Jen on Twitter, okay. Uh, Jen asks, is it safer to be on the eighth floor of a building on an inlet or evacuate inland to a ground level house or even Orlando. So this is, there's a lot of answers. The first answer and the answer that all that really only matters is if you're told to evacuate, you evacuate. Hands down, period. Exactly. If not, then you stay. Then if you're you stay. not told to evacuate, right. you stay. The evacuation orders will consider where you are, you know, in right. proximity to the to the coastline. You run from the water, hide from the wind is always sort of the, the rule of thumb. And evacuation orders take that into yeah. account. And you might not be better in Orlando. So if they right. tell you evacuate, right. evacuate. Okay. Was it uh, Charlie or Jean or Francis? No, no, no. It was uh, Charlie. Charlie was a cat that, too over Orlando. And, and did then, damage. right, right. So it came in. Some people evacuated to Orlando, and then yep. they with, without power there as well. All right. Another question from Ten Mile Grego: Does daytime heating have any effect on the strength or circulation of a hurricane like it does on thunderstorms? Yes and no. Yeah, I think this is a good question because a lot of times during the overnight we see an uptick actually right. in activity. But the daytime heating obviously is not going to hurt the hurricane. Right. It's going to heat up the environment around it, which right. you can fuel yeah. off it. It heats up the water. But it's these don't these are not like severe storms you see in the Midwest. Yeah, it's so a little bit different. It's not it's not related to you know you need the sun to come out to raise the instability. The instability is there. I mean these are the things we look for for tropical in ingredients. The trigger with the starting point, the moisture, and we are going to see Dorian moving into an environment with a lot more moisture compared to the, the dryer that had been battling favorable upper level winds, which would be light winds, not yes. strong winds. Yes, for the hurricane and uh, warm water, which we will see. And you know there's a good deep layer of warm water, um, which will allow you know, even if it moves slowly, allow it to keep yeah. strengthening. All right, so please keep your questions coming using the hashtag hurricane questions we'll answer them throughout the day here on the weather channel Jim I gotta say I'm very impressed with our yeah, viewers people have some really They're good questions really you, asking intelligent and you guys have some great answers too so yeah, great job great really job with those questions, questions. Uh, guys the hurricane hunters are on the way out by the way send your questions to hurricane questions uh, as we have right there the hurricane hunters are on their way out there now east of the Bahamas uh, that information will be placed into the 11 o'clock advisory. This is this is it right now. We don't have any land observations. What we're going to get from that plane, this is Kermit, by the way, leaving Lakeland uh, earlier on this morning, uh, heading out. Now you can see, though, from some of the latest satellite pictures, we have an eye showing up on satellite. It's been there for a couple of blocks. Look at Jacksonville. Talk about the calm before the storm. Beautiful day in J-Bill. 
This program brought to you by Liberty Mutual Insurance. Only pay for what you need. After the unpredictable storm spares Puerto Rico from a direct hit. We don't know where this is going to go, so it's time to be calm. Make sure you know your zone. So how bad could it be, and how will it affect your holiday weekend? Al's tracking it all. Then, dress for success? Why more public schools around the country are requiring students to wear school uniforms. With the uniforms, and they have the specific colors, you already know what, that, what she's going to wear the next day. Just ahead, how major retailers are cashing in on the classroom attire. And queen of country will catch up with Grammy winner Trisha Yearwood as she prepares for the release of her first solo album in more than a decade. She'll give us a sneak peek with a live performance today, Thursday, August 29th, 2019. Birthday to you, good sir, and welcome back to today on this Thursday morning. Craig Melvin here alongside Kristen Walker, who's in for Savannah, as Hoda makes the most of her final days of maternity leave. She'll be back, of course, next Tuesday, September 3rd. Mark your calendars. Lots of smiles, lots of laughs. Can't wait to have her back in Studio 1A. That's right. The whole family will be yeah. back together again. Everyone looking forward to that. And we want to check something out outside. We have something very special happening on the plaza right now. Volunteers with Operation Backpack are loading up supplies to make sure all kids have the tools they need for the start of the new school year. We'll have more on that on Just Ahead. And Craig, I can't wait for this story because it's so important yes. for these kids yeah. to arrive at school with their supplies. Prepared, ready to exactly. go. We're going to go outside and help stuff some backpacks in just a bit. It is a busy morning, though, so let's get straight to your news at 8 o'clock. Parts of Florida are under a state of emergency this morning as Hurricane Dorian grows stronger as it makes its way to the East Coast. Al's got the latest update for us. Al, what are we seeing right now? Well, you know, very interesting. We normally get an update at 8 a.m. from the National Hurricane Center. However, they have not issued it yet, and so that might mean that there are changes afoot that we are, they are still working on. But here's what we have from the latest. 85-mile-per-hour winds. It's moving northwest at 13 miles per hour. Track of the storm. We won't get an updated track until 11 o'clock, but this is the latest. A Category 3 storm by Saturday morning at 2 a.m. It continues towards the Bahamas as a three, makes a landfall sometime Monday morning and then moves inland on Tuesday as a Category 1 storm. Comparing the other tracks to the National Hurricane Center track, the American model makes landfall in northern Florida from Monday night. The European model, South Florida, on Monday evening. So we're going to watch these systems as they kind of converge, but until then, we don't have consensus. We do, though, know that we're going to be looking at a very high risk of hurricane force winds by Sunday evening moving into the central eastern Florida coast. And as far as rainfall is concerned, we are talking about four to eight inches generally from northern, uh, central to into southern Florida, but upwards of 12 inches in some spots. But again, we still have a number of days while it's out over open water, so we'll be watching this closely. Kristen? We know you will be. All right, Al, thank you for that. To politics now, where the field for the 2020 Democratic presidential nomination has narrowed, with New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand ending her bid. She said Wednesday that it's important to know when it's not your time and how you can best serve. Gillibrand is the first senator and the first woman to drop out of the race. Her decision came after she failed to get the donor or polling number she needed to qualify for the third Democratic debate. That's coming up just next month. The city of Milwaukee is out with almost unanimously. There's hard to, hard to get away from that. All right, so it has an upper level feature it's dealing with right now. Anything else in the projected path that were, could maybe tear it up a little bit, uh, decrease the intensity? As long as it's this close to this upper level low and this dry air loft, that is trying to still get into the storm. And I think that's holding back a little bit the rate of strengthening mm -hmm. because we're seeing some of the inner core of this system dry out a little bit. There are other things going on inside for sure. But as long as that continues, this south wind with some dry air getting in there, 
that's a good thing because that won't allow it, I don't think, to strengthen very quickly. Now, they're not always going to be this close yeah. together. Are they going to stay that way? <laughs> Dorian is not going to run into it. We know Dorian is moving in that direction, but so is the low, and that low is backing off as well. Mm -hmm. That's going to get out of the way, and when Dorian moves northward and closes in on the southeast U.S., the atmosphere will be more supportive of strengthening, and so will the ocean. All right, so the atmosphere is going to get better. You say the ocean, obviously, yep. it's not going to cool off here. This is a map of water temperatures. You know, they're steady for the next couple of days. Plenty warm to support mm -hmm. a major hurricane even now. But as it closes in on the Gulf, uh, Gulf Stream out in there, the water gets even warmer. And yeah, the ocean like heat content is very high. 85 up to the upper 80 water temperature? Yes, and uh, that is always something to consider as storms mm -hmm. move in that direction. They will go over progressively warmer and warmer water right in that area as it closes in on the U.S. coastline. But exactly where on the U.S. coastline, yeah. we don't know for sure. But the idea is that this will likely be strengthening maybe all the way to landfall. And as you've been mentioning, don't just focus on Florida, even right? though it's in the path. We've got to look northward as well. As well. Carol. They're not off. Those scenarios are not off the table. Mm -hmm. The ones that take it even farther north than the cone. All right. But certainly Florida is definitely preparing for the potential of mm -hmm. heavy rain coming in from Hurricane Dorian. And as we look at cities right now, you say, what hurricane, huh? This is beautiful. Yeah, another sunny day with the afternoon thunderstorms expected really on both coasts of Florida. We are looking live at Miami. We're going over to Daytona. We're hitting Jacksonville and even Tampa. Not a lot of folks on the beaches right now. They're probably hopefully getting hurricane supplies ready. But we do anticipate the weather to go downhill late in the weekend. In fact, we are expecting rainfall certainly to come in. The atmosphere is conducive. There's a lot of moisture here. You can go outside and feel the humidity across Florida. And as we move into the Saturday time frame, still expecting some scattered showers and thunderstorms. But then by Sunday is when we think not just maybe some rain, but also some of that wind being picked up here uh, as it makes landfall right now into Florida. This scenario takes it into South Florida. And again, that's the center circulation. Well, to the north, we can still be expecting some of those stronger winds. So as we look at the potential for rain, quite heavy anywhere from central to the east coast of Florida, but even over into Tampa and the parts of the panhandle could see some significant rainfall from this. Let's look at another computer forecast model. And again, this one taking it into South Florida, then pushing a lot of that moisture and perhaps the winds farther to the north. Uh, another model taking it in farther north up around Melbourne, the Cape Canaveral, Daytona Beach area, and then northward we'll find the heavier amounts of rainfall. Here is the potential. We are likely to see a lot of rain and that could lead to some flooding, which therefore could lead to your deaths and deaths have occurred throughout this year. Up to 78 people have died because of flooding here in the states. So again, something we want you to be obviously aware of. The anticipation of Dorian's arrival is definitely grabbing headlines throughout the Sunshine State from the Orlando Sentinel to the Gainesville Sun to the Pensacola News Journal. Message is pretty clear. Dorian is the one to watch. And while we can't pinpoint the exact landfall location of Dorian right now, we are pretty confident that there are going to be some impacts here into Florida. So let's yet again look at uh, the timing of this event. Throughout today, if you see some rain, it's not from Dorian. It's just those afternoon thunderstorms. That would be the scenario for tomorrow as well. Dorian is going to stay well away from the Bahamas for the next two days. But then uh, on Saturday, maybe late Friday, is when we expect that westward movement. And there we can see it coming closer towards the northern Bahama Islands. And if it continues that westward movement, that would mean it comes into Florida. And we would see some of those tropical storm force winds as early as, here's the, I didn't mean to do that one. Let me do this one. Sunday time frame, Sunday morning, we could see some of those stronger winds coming in, uh, 40 to even higher amounts as far as the winds. And that could start to close down some transportation uh, issues with airports and the bus services. This is what we are suggesting that you do right now over the next few days here. Uh, get your home ready for it. Get your family ready for it. Make sure that you're telling relatives and friends 
what your plans are. A lot of people want to know about the winds and will how far north will we be seeing those? Well, again, if it comes into the uh, South Florida area, we'll start to see those tropical storm force winds even farther to the north, maybe as far north as the Georgia Florida line. Hurricane force winds again coming into central and south Florida. We'll feel those hurricane force winds perhaps as far as Fernandina Beach and into Jacksonville. Well, here's what we know. I know it's a lot to absorb. Florida, you've declared a state of emergency as Floridians are urged to prepare now for Dorian. The governor of Georgia, he uh, is going to open uh, upper, the emergency operations center today at noon ahead of Hurricane Dorian. Dorian has claimed one life so far. An elderly man died in Puerto Rico while preparing for the storm. Coming up, Miami has escaped the big one for a while, but could Dorian change that? We look at what makes Miami vulnerable to the type of hurricanes we could see in just a few days. Into Florida on Labor Day. And so now is the time to prepare for the latest on Dorian right now here on Weather Center Live. And welcome back, everybody. I'm meteorologist Jennifer Lopez, alongside hurricane expert mm -hmm. Dr. Greg Forbes. And Dr. Forbes, or we've been... Postel, either Dr. one. They did it, again. it happens a lot. It's a compliment. <laughs> it's just... I'm, just, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Postel telling us that uh, the latest on this hurricane, and we've been talking about it for more than 24 hours now, but... Mm -hmm. What are we seeing from just a day ago to what we're finding right now? You know, there's not a whole lot of change today mm -hmm. versus what we were looking at yesterday. I think the intensity forecast has come up a little bit, and maybe that's one of the most noteworthy aspects of it. But the idea that Dorian there on your satellite picture is going to come to the southeastern United States is real. And that remains the case. The forecast is very confident on that left or westward turn over the weekend, closing in on the southeast United States. And uh, again, look at that intensity. The official intensity forecast has this thing at Cat 4 at landfall. Well, when it came through the Virgin Islands yesterday, it was a tropical storm with strong gusty winds and then quickly became a hurricane. Those winds lashed the U.S. Virgin Islands and the island of St. Thomas had a, at least four inches of rain and winds were higher than 100 miles an hour at times. Reports on the island of wide black, uh, widespread blackouts on St. Thomas and St. John. Wicked winds did rip through St. John on the, Virgin, on the U.S. Virgin Islands, taking out a few of the palm trees here and also bringing with it very heavy rainfall. We want to bring you the latest information that we have on Hurricane Dorian. It is forecast to become a major hurricane that puts it at Category 3 status by tomorrow. The threat for hurricane conditions as well as storm surge continues to increase through the Bahamas and across the Florida East Coast. It is too soon, though, to pinpoint exactly where the worst conditions will occur and exactly where the center of circulation will make landfall. But we want to look more at this hurricane and we'll go over to Greg now. Yeah, Jennifer, thank you very much. I mean, we are looking at a Category 1 hurricane on its way toward the United States. It is going to strengthen, and very significantly so. Right now, the hurricane hunters are in there and finding this is about an 80 to 90 mile per hour hurricane. So 85 miles per hour, spot on. It continues to move toward the northwest at about 13 miles per hour. Pressure somewhere underneath 990 millibars, officially estimated at around 986. So the thinking today hasn't changed a whole lot from this time yesterday. The intensity forecast has come up a bit, but overall the track is remarkably similar to yesterday. That Dorian there now, north of uh, the Dominican Republic, is going to continue on that northwestern movement and then turn toward the United States. Unfortunately, very likely now making a landfall somewhere along the mainland U.S. late in the weekend or early next week. There it is right now in the water vapor imagery. You can see the movement of the hurricane has been steady as she goes right along that northwestward path. And the upper level low nearby is continuing to influence that trajectory. So the reason why it has not yet turned west is because the flow around that upper level low is not allowing that to happen. It is continuing to move it in that direction. It is also supplying it with some mid-altitude dry air as well, which is continuing to somewhat interfere with the development internally. 
Now, there are other factors going on, to be sure, that is keeping the intensity at 85 miles per hour. But when you look inside of it, hurricane hunters are doing their dutiful job here, zigzagging their way through it and finding those 80 to 90 mile per hour winds right near the center of circulation. It's right now not a very big hurricane. In fact, the hurricane force winds really only extend outward about 15 miles from the center. And you can actually see some almost clear sky, not very far from where the center of circulation is right there. So there's some dry air getting wrapped in, and that is uh, in part playing a role in, uh, I would say, limiting the intensification rate. But there you go, hurricane force winds out about 15 miles, but I expect that to grow in size as this begins to move toward the northwest and then eventually north. The atmosphere will become more favorable for intensification as it closes in on the United States. Here are the ensemble tracks from the ECMWF model. In other words, the models actually run a whole lot of times, each time it bit differently, each time giving you a bit of a different scenario. Not all of them are equally likely, but the idea is that there are options that still bring it into perhaps Georgia and very close to the Carolina coast. So we have to be mindful of that as well. So this westward turn, which is almost certain to take place, we don't know how exactly how far north Dorian is going to be when it begins to bend to the west. And that might have an impact on who gets the most significant hazards when landfall eventually, we think, does occur late in the weekend again or early next week. The blocking high to the north, that is going to likely, if not almost certainly, prevent an escape route to the north away from the United States. It's almost like there's no other way this thing can go than make landfall like the Hurricane Center projects like this, Jennifer. I mean, it's just like, it's like no way this uh -huh. thing is going to be one of those out-to-sea storms. It is very likely to impact at a high-end scale, like a Category 4 intensity, bringing all the usual hazards of destructive right. and dangerous winds, storm surge, and very heavy rain as well. And the other thing, too, is it probably slows down right as it approaches mm -hmm. or moves over land and then begins to turn toward the north. Yeah, it looks like we're going to have days and days to continue to watch this system and prepare right. for uh, this hurricane. And in Florida, that's just what people are doing. In fact, some are scrambling to make sure that they have supplies they need before Dorian arrives. As Jen Carfagno explained, some saw how the Caribbean fared, and they don't want to wait until the last minute. I can't imagine doing this Friday. It's going to be crazy Friday. Orlando on alert as a major hurricane approaches the state of Florida during a holiday weekend. I think that everyone has their idea of of the level of urgency. <laughs> our our neighbor said we're not getting nothing. And of course the other neighbor is going to the store and buying everything they can possibly buy. Previous hurricanes have taught these central Floridians the necessity of preparation. Getting gas fueling off the car, getting gas tanks for the generator. So previous uh, hurricane he had to, we ran out of power power went out and you're up the convenience store every other day getting gas so three gas tanks <laughs> I'm good. And we're, we're literally sampling sampling air way over here. Why yeah. way over here? Well, look, for example, part of the uh, jet stream activity is over there. And you want to have that accurate. So this part is accurate. So this part is accurate. And you can put the picture together. It's like if you're going to make a local forecast, first thing you do, look out the window. That's proverbially what we're doing mm -hmm. by getting off to a good start with these models. But there's no way to... Uh, get all the models to agree perfectly. So we have sure. to use a collection of models. So let's take a look at a couple of them just to illustrate the point that the t different models can give you a different track and try to explain why. And it's all about that ridge to the north. So mm -hmm. let's take a look at the European model as we go from this evening into tomorrow. Okay. That turn to the left will probably have materialized, and then that ridge in the European model's eye will extend all the way across the southeast U.S. from Texas all the way across the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. That's why it's going to be headed westward. Now, let's go to the GFS. Let's take from tonight into tomorrow night. Pretty good agreement, but look at by Sunday, it's a little bit farther along, mm -hmm. okay, um, and, and going farther west. Now, let's compare that to what the, GFS, to what the Euro does by Sunday. It's a little bit farther behind, okay? So they disagree on some little details mm -hmm. on how strong that ridge is and how far west it's going to be and exactly where that left-hand turn occurs. So on Sunday evening, we already have a little bit of a difference. That means all the world to different people sure. in Florida. Now that we're, we're, the new data that we're getting today will go into the models and that'll be coming out in 
the morning model run. Yeah, the, the G4 jet mission right now and the balloon launches this afternoon and this evening, those go into the model runs that run tonight and then they see that output at the Hurricane Center to feed into the 5 a.m. advisory. So, so in theory, tomorrow's track, in theory, should be a little bit more accurate. Hopefully. It gives a better idea of where it's Yeah, headed. the idea is to get it more accurate into better agreement. Look at how far south the European is into Monday, and then look how much farther north mm -hmm. and farther along the GFS is Monday night. So they disagree on speed, they disagree on how far north or south, and that's why everybody east coast of Florida still needs to pay attention. All things considered, though, they're in the ballpark. It's not like one yeah. is way up in the Carolinas. Or they both have it coming to Florida. They both say it's coming across or near the northwestern Bahamas. They both say it's coming to or very near to Florida. And they both say Sunday into Monday, it's going to be moving slowly. slowly. All right, that's uh, very good information. Now, we know in Florida, people scrambling to make sure they have the supplies that they need before Dorian arrives. As Jen Carfagno shows, growing lines are proof that people are taking this storm seriously. I can't imagine doing this Friday. It's going to be crazy Friday. Orlando on alert as a major hurricane approaches the state of Florida during a mover increases the flood potential and longer you push ocean toward the coast, mm -hmm. the worse the storm surge can get. Most likely Peninsula Florida, but elsewhere in the southeast, get ready for inland flooding. Turn right. around, don't drown. Think a about it now. Absolutely. Uh, let doubt. That's in Orlando. I mean, how far inland is Orlando? From the coast uh, uh, a good bit yeah but they're, but they're, they're close enough to get close some really enough. bad yeah but the entire state of florida should be preparing knowing that we've got the wind forecast that's amped up like this it, even if you're far away from the coast you can have really significant effects bad winds even tornadoes and flooding rains uh, even if you're outside the storm surge zone. And it's, it's kind of a good thing in some sense, Mike, mm -hmm. that a lot of people are going to the stores now because yeah. stores can still resupply over the next few days. They're not going to run out of everything for right. the rest of the week. And if everybody did what they're doing today on Saturday when the hurricane is right on That'd our doorstep, problem. that would be bad. So it's good to see that people are doing what they need to so do you, ahead of so time. So you're giving actually people a little bit of hope here. They're like, yeah. I can't get out there. I can't do it today. I've got to work or I've got to get my kids. I just don't have an opportunity. They may still have an opportunity tomorrow or Saturday, yeah. maybe even Sunday morning. Yeah, absolutely. There, there, is, there is still plenty of time to get done what you need to get done if you start acting now. I mean, plenty of time is relative. I mean, if you just sit around for the next three days and then do everything at the last minute, that's bad news because we don't have that many days before Dorian comes. But there's enough time for you to get ready for the storm and the aftermath. Unfortunately, in that time, Dorian has plenty of time to strengthen, and dramatically so. Hasn't done it today, but we expect that it will. 85 miles an hour, the maximum sustained winds. Uh, Air Force hurricane hunters are on their way in. We'll share those data with you uh, when we get it. Uh, and also, what's also troubling today is that there is this trailing band that extends down to Puerto Rico. They're having more rain and flooding concerns in some parts of Puerto Rico today than they did yesterday. Just goes to show you that you don't have to be near the center of circulation to be getting some bad effects of a hurricane. It's small. I mean, compared to uh, Florida and the southeast U.S., uh, this is a, a, a tiny system, but that might not stay that way. It could intensify, go through structural changes, and become a larger hurricane by the time it gets over the northwestern Bahamas and Florida and the southeast U.S. Uh, it hasn't changed too much in its appearance today, and it is bringing a lot of rainfall in Puerto Rico. So the appearance of the weather in Puerto Rico has gotten a lot worse today. This southerly flow is really enhancing uh, the squeezing out of the moisture. We've even had a flash flood warning there on the southeast side of the island, right there. Got a flash flood warning for a little while longer. Uh, it will get better, though, as Dorian pulls uh, farther away. Let's zoom in on the hurricane itself here, and I'll try to point out some features. Uh, you can't see them really well on the visible and infrared. But what we do know from aircraft data is that there is one interior eye that's only you know, five miles across or something. But then there's an exterior eye right about in there that's maybe 20 to 25 miles across. And when that interior one goes away, that outer one is the one we think is going to be the focus of the intensification over the next 24 hours. And the Hurricane Center is forecasting pretty robust intensification. It's not every day that they go up 30 miles an hour 
in 24 hours in their explicit forecast. So they're pretty confident in, in having a robust forecast like that. And then these numbers are pretty scary, no doubt about it, uh, becoming perhaps a category four, can't rule out category five, and you can't rule out a lot of ups and downs in intensity between now and its uh, approach to Florida. But you also have to pay very close attention to the forward speed. We have pretty high confidence that it's gonna be moving more slowly over the weekend and into early next week than it is now. And Mike, that is not good news. Mm -hmm. All of these uh, meandering tracks in the European ensemble are example of how uh, undulating its motion could be and how it could hang around and loop around and really ramp up the flooding and lengthen the time you deal with damaging winds and storm surge. So right. I hate these slow movers. They're usually a big water disaster. The thing about it is, you know, the short term forecast next day or two, you know, there's a lot more certainty in that forecast than there is four or five days out. So. Yes, yes, absolutely the case. All right, All right Dr. Neff, thank you. And if you have questions about Dory, we are here to answer your questions tonight. Uh, please on Twitter or on Facebook, send them our way. You can include the hashtag hurricane question, hurricane questions. Okay, when you do that, then we can just assemble all of them together, and we're going to answer them rapid fire a little bit later this hour. So stick around. Maybe your question will be answered. Now, um, we're getting a little bit better idea of where Dorian is headed. Why? Because of all the data that's going into the computer models to help us forecast, including collecting data from weather balloon soundings. These are um, done twice a day, typically, at every national weather, just about every national weather service office in the country. We'll send them up um, 12Z uh, and... Uh, in the morning, but they're doing an extra one at 18Z, um, so six hours later. So instead of doing two a day, then they're going to do a four a day, okay? So you're going to get one at 12Z, you're going to get one at 18Z, you're going to get one at 0Z, then you're going to get one at 6Z. That's Zulu time. Uh, that's what I'm referring to. Why? So that we can better understand the atmosphere. That, by the way, was Brownsville, Texas. Brownsville, Texas is sampling the atmosphere, Dr. Neff. That's so far away from where this thing is out in the Atlantic. Yeah, and it is so important to realize how many resources are being brought to bear in order to try to make the best forecast. But while they're doing all that, we need to be doing a lot of things to decide on shelter. Uh, this is just one list of things to be keeping in mind uh, about deciding on where to shelter from this hurricane. Now, if we look at what could happen in terms of the pattern and where the models take this. So we're gonna compare the European and the GFS models here, okay. Mike, and you're gonna see the colors are the low level spin, and here you're gonna see where the high pressure ridge is gonna be setting up, and we're gonna compare the two models at various stages. So tonight into Sunday, here's what the European model does, and it strengthens that ridge to the north, so much so that the European model has it staying pretty far south going over the northwestern Bahamas. So that's Sunday well, and night. And why they're, they're, they've got all these balloon launches happening in Texas and in Oklahoma. They really want to understand this, this entire thing here, right? Yeah, and these are the 500 millibar, about 20,000 feet up. That's a really good proxy for where the steering is going to be. But also, these upper level winds, the traveling white lines, you're, those balloons and the G4 jet data are getting vertical profiles all the way up and down the atmosphere to get into the global models. These are global models that we're looking at. So you need to observe well all over the place to get that global model off to a good start mm -hmm. and sample and forecast all of these features around the hurricane that are going to be driving it. But they don't all agree. Look at the GFS model when we take it from Saturday night into Sunday night. It's a little bit faster and it's a little bit farther north. Just subtle differences in the strength and location mm -hmm. of that ridge mean, you know, just a few miles or a few dozen miles difference in where it goes, but that makes all the difference between sure. what county or what city gets the worst of it. So that's through Sunday. Now let's take it from Sunday into Monday. The European is slowing down and it's still over the Northwestern Bahamas on Monday. Look at the GFS. Sunday into Monday, the GFS has brought it over Florida. So there's disagreement on how far north it is when it comes toward Florida. It's disagreeing on what the forward speed is, but they're both slowing down near the end here. Let's go one more frame ahead. We go from Monday into Tuesday. The European still hasn't brought it to Florida mm -hmm. and the GFS has 
it slowly moving over Florida. Both of them are slow, they're just not mm -hmm. in the same place, but all of that, Mike, is just subtle differences mm -hmm. in these ridges. Hopefully that additional data we're collecting yeah. will get these models into better agreement. And they're gonna keep doing that um, until they're told not to. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but that weakness in the ridge is why it's slowing down. As a forecaster, when you used to work at the Hurricane Center, yeah. how valuable is all that Hurricane Hunter data? How invaluable is all the um, draw all the um, songs that are being sent out. Well, those data are not only important to get into the models, but they allow the human forecaster to ascertain what's going on in the atmosphere and to diagnose where the shear is and what the steering is and try to figure out which model has a good start. Because mm -hmm. you can compare the observations to the model fields at the same time and say, oh, this model's off to a better start. It can give you a clue as to which one might have a better forecast. Fingers, that's hard, cro though. Fingers that's crossed hard. that all that data, in theory, yeah. is supposed to give us a little bit more accurate forecast. We know that in addition to something like bottled drinking water, it doesn't hurt to have some extra water ready for a storm. This video from Titusville, Florida, where a woman filling tubs with water the Weather Service says stored water, very useful. Why? Well, we know you can flush your toilet with it if the water happens to be shut off. Um, you can bathe in it. Uh, you, drinking water. Clean your you, wounds. You, cl you can use it for first aid. Make, um, making baby for formula. Your pets, baby formula. Yeah. You can cook with it. Yeah. Um, you need so, a lot of it. So what, fill up your bathtubs. Fill up, you know, uh, big Rubbermaid tubs like this. And be prepared. Just be prepared. That's the key thing here, right? Well, let's talk a little bit more then about folks that may be in danger of water from the hurricane itself, either from surge or from flooding. Yeah, so let's talk about storm surge for a little bit and just highlight that this is not just about Florida. A lot of other states are at risk for at some point getting storm surge. And the main thing you need to do today is find out what your risk is where you live or where you're visiting. Do you live in an evacuation zone? Georgia, you can go to ready.ga.gov and find out your evacuation zones. If you're in the state of Florida, go to floridadisaster.org. Mike, let's take a look at some of those evacuation yeah. zones that you can find on that Florida website. Do you have, first of all, you gotta know your address. <laughs> yeah. You gotta know where you live. And then in Florida, it's gonna be coordinated by the alphabet. Yeah, and this is good that the evacuation zones are labeled by color and by letter. They used to be back in the day, evacuation zones identified by category on the Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale. We've learned that a big category one can produce terrible storm surge. Mm -hmm. So you don't, don't label uh, your evacuation zone and, and don't think about whether or not you evacuate or not based on the category of the hurricane. That's not the issue. Uh, in central Florida, east coast, this is Cape Canaveral, Titusville area. Obviously the Cape and Merritt Island very vulnerable, but there are places along the coast in Titusville and up and down the I-95 corridor that are vulnerable to storm surge. And the farther north you go, Mike, the farther inland that the storm surge can go because the continental shelf gets mm -hmm. wider and the water is shallower, so you can bring the water all the way to I-95 Water's going to be over A1A, potentially, yeah. and then maybe all the way to I-95, just up to I-95. And then northeastern Florida in the St. Augustine area, you have the problems near the coast, but you also have evacuation zones along the St. Johns River because the storm surge, if the hurricane mm -hmm. is far enough north, can push the water into the river. You get water rises on the St. Johns River and look at Duval County, Jacksonville area, how large of an area is in an evacuation zone. Doesn't Amazing. mean you have to evacuate, doesn't mean it's coming your way, it just means you need to know if there you're in one of these zones and, and it's called later. And zone A, by the way, comes way in yep. on the river, way, way away from the coast. Yeah, here's Jacksonville downtown, that can be vulnerable to storm surge in the in the wrong scenario. Know your zone and when you're asked yep. to evacuate, uh, you'll, you'll be all the much smarter for it here. All right, let's take you to San Juan, Puerto Rico, by the way. Uh, Get this, flash flood watch is in effect for us. You're thinking, well, I thought the hurricane has passed. Well, it did. We got trailing storms there, though, that have produced some really heavy rain. Uh, and so that's another concern. So be prepared for those thunderstorms. They should begin to taper off later tonight as the storm itself starts to pull away a little bit more. But maybe the worst weather you've had is what you've experienced today and not yesterday when it was hurt at its closest to Puerto Rico. Yeah, this hurricanes can be very oh. ironic in a bad way sometimes. And it just re reiterates, just because the center of the hurricane has passed you doesn't mean the hazards are done. So we, that's why we're not gonna focus right. and obsess over landfall when that occurs, wherever it occurs, because a lot of bad weather could be after that. All right, let's Form. A state of emergency across Florida. Residents lining up for gas, supplies, and sandbags. When will it hit and where? We just got the latest update. Rob Marciano standing by. Also new tonight, the DOJ saying former FBI director James Comey violated FBI policies in his handling of memos about President Trump. The Justice Department declined to prosecute. 
why Comey says he's the one who's owed an apology. The growing alarm about vaping as one American city urges everyone to stop immediately. The sharp rise in the number of severe lung injuries. What do we really know about the safety of these products? The school bus scare. A child nearly struck when a driver blows past the bus with its stop sign extended. The warning from that mother to other parents. Escaping the volcano, a massive eruption throwing lava, rock, and ash into the sky, then raining down as nearby tourists flee. Out of control, the hot air balloon bouncing off the ground, the pilot and a passenger thrown from the basket. And America Strong, Alex Trebek is back for a new season of Jeopardy amid questions about his cancer fight. Tonight, his message to fans. This is ABC World News Tonight with David Muir. And good evening. It's great to have you with us on a busy Thursday night. I'm Tom Yamas, in for David. And as we come on tonight, all eyes are on Dorian. It could now be a Category 4 storm when it slams ashore. Here's the latest storm track with landfall shifting slightly to the south. You can see that right here. But all of Florida is now in a state of emergency and parts of Georgia as well. Dorian already hammering the U.S. Virgin Islands on St. Thomas. Roofs blown off and an island-wide blackout left behind. More than 17 million people on the U.S. mainland now bracing for impact. Long lines at gas stations, some already drained dry. A run on lumber to protect windows from the fierce wind. And the race to meet the need for bottled water. People being warned to stock up with several days supply. Tonight, Dorian is shaping up to be one of the strongest hurricanes to strike the Florida coast in years. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano starts us off tracking it all from Florida. Rob, good evening. Good evening, Tom. Hurricane Dorian now about 800 miles from here over the open waters of the Atlantic Ocean with a lot of warm water and time to get better organized, and it's doing just that. Here's a satellite picture. You can see it. 85-mile-per-hour uh, winds sustained. It has tropical storm force winds that range about 120 miles across, uh, but it's heading into an area that has low wind shear and warm waters. That combination is going to allow it to strengthen potentially rapidly. That high pressure is going to scoot it off to the west toward the U.S. So here's the forecast track and timing. It has slowed a little bit so that by Sunday afternoon, maybe early Monday, it's just off the coastline as a Category 4 storm with 130 miles an hour winds, likely making landfall Monday or Tuesday. But a lot of uncertainty here. There are two most reliable computer models. The European model and the American GFS are completely different. The GFS comes here and then goes north. The European goes towards Miami and then scoots up the coastline. So we'll hope to get better a grasp on this tomorrow. They're going to launch extra weather balloons tonight, more recount on aircraft, so the confidence in the forecast should increase tomorrow, but one thing is for sure, a high-impact storm is likely to come to Florida, so residents here need to be prepared over this weekend. Tom? Rob Marciano and his team tracking all that, that storm. As we said, Florida is in a state of emergency tonight as Hurricane Dorian barrels towards the mainland. People are already waiting in long lines for gas and water and other supplies. ABC's Gio Benitez is in Miami tonight with the rush to get ready. Tonight, worried residents are lining up across the entire state of Florida, snapping up supplies. Good morning. Outside this Lowe's near Orlando before dawn, racing to get generators and long waits for fuel at this Tampa area Costco. This is what we're seeing all across South Florida. People preparing for this storm, loading up that plywood to board up their homes. At this Miami Home Depot, we met Jose Noriega buying 26 sandbags. Obviously planning for the worst uh, possible, but hoping for the best. Dorian tore through the U.S. and British Virgin Islands Wednesday, winds gusting above 110 miles per hour, ripping this roof to pieces. And tonight, it's getting stronger by the minute. Florida's governor today telling residents the time to prepare is now. You should have seven days of food uh, and medicine um, and water. With more than 17 million people, nearly the entire state of Florida in the cone of uncertainty, mass evacuations are likely. It's mind-boggling because nobody knows exactly where this, this storm's going. Hurricane hunters flying inside Dorian, trying to track the storm's every movement. At the Kennedy Space Center, NASA using this crawler to move a 400-foot-tall mobile launcher out of harm's way. Florida Power and Light bracing for outages, some 15,000 transformers on hand, 5,000 crew members standing by. We are ready, we're prepared, and we will address all the outages 
as they happen. Dorian now potentially the strongest hurricane to strike Florida's east coast since Andrew, a Category 5 in 1992. The last Category 4, Irma, in 2017, first making landfall in the Florida Keys, packing winds of 130 miles per hour. Andrew and Irma leaving back so much de uh, devastation. Gio joins us now live from Home Depot in Miami. Gio, the storm is still several days away from making landfall, but there are still questions about where it will hit. But from what you're seeing right now, some people seem to be taking this very seriously. Oh, they sure are, Tom. This is a very busy store right now. And take a look at these shelves behind me because some of them have just emptied out because so many people are buying this plywood to board up their homes. The manager here says he hasn't seen it this busy in years. Tom? The rush is on. All right, Gio, thank you. And, of course, Hurricane Dorian is arriving just ahead of Labor Day, disrupting a busy travel weekend. A record 17.5 million passengers were set to fly over the next few days with millions more planning to drive. Tonight, their plans could be changing. ABC's Kaylee Hartung is at the airport in Jacksonville, Florida tonight. Kaylee. Tom, all the major airlines are issuing travel waivers starting tomorrow for flights into Florida's big airports like the one here in Jacksonville. But the impacts of Dorian as it approaches will be felt far beyond this state. Throughout Florida, airports are securing equipment. The military safeguarding planes, too. And the Coast Guard, they're strapping down boats. But the big question for the millions who live here is what will happen on the state's major roads? Officials trying to avoid a repeat of some of the traffic nightmares that happened in the lead-up to Hurricane Irma. So crews are clearing up construction along the roadways in advance of any potential evacuation orders. Tom. Kaylee Hartung for us tonight. Kaylee, thank you. Breaking news tonight. Hurricane Dorian taking dead aim at Florida. The new track as we come on the air. Dorian gaining strength, poised to strike as a powerful Category 4 storm this holiday weekend. The storm surge potentially life-threatening. States of emergency just declared in Georgia, expanded to every county in Florida. Millions on alert. The rush to get ready. President Trump canceling a trip overseas to monitor the storm. Al Roker is tracking it all. Also tonight, under fire, former FBI Chief James Comey. The Justice Department's watchdog finding Comey violated rules by leaked memos of private conversations with President Trump. How the president is reacting. The urgent warning for e-cigarette users. Stop vaping immediately, health officials say. I had no idea what was happening inside my body, and that is very scary. Tonight, the numbers of vapors with lung disease growing. The shocking surveillance. A pregnant jail inmate in labor. Her cries for help, she says, went ignored. The woman forced to give birth in her cell alone. The terrifying discovery. A massive arsenal. Dozens of guns. Eight grenades. More than 2,000 rounds inside the home. And that's not all police found. And the slam dunk that seems impossible until you see it with your own eyes. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening, I'm Kristen Welker, in for Lester. We begin tonight with the millions of Americans bracing for what could be a dangerous and deadly storm. Hurricane Dorian is intensifying as it churns toward the U.S. The storm is expected to strengthen to a Category 4 hurricane before hitting Florida over the holiday weekend. With Dorian on that collision course, many are now preparing for a direct hit, stocking up on food and medicine, and some are even getting out of town. Tonight, there is an expanded state of emergency in Florida and parts of Georgia, and we begin our coverage with Al Roker. Al, what are you seeing out there? Kristen, the latest from the National Hurricane Center, 85 mile power winds with Dorian, northwesterly movement at 13 miles per hour. It quickly becomes a Category 3 tomorrow, a Category 4 on Sunday. Landfall, Central Florida on Monday afternoon. The American model, landfall, Central Florida on Monday in the European, down in Southern Florida on Tuesday. Catastrophic winds over the Bahamas on Sunday. Hurricane force winds for Florida on Monday and the rainfall. Coastal sections of the southeastern Florida area, five to ten inches of rain, isolated 15 inches. We're still watching these models trying to coalesce and we haven't even talked about storm surge yet. Kristen, it Sorry. really bears watching all weekend long. Indeed. All right, Al Roker, thank you for that. And in Florida tonight, the state's 21 million people have been placed on alert. Residents racing to get ready and tourists scrambling to get out as Dorian approaches. The Coast Guard late today raising the alert level for Port Canaveral. And that is where we find NBC's Kathy Park tonight. 
Hurricane Dorian slammed into the Caribbean, flooding streets, toppling trees, and capsizing boats, but spared the islands from major disaster. Now the storm has its eye on Florida and is expected to hit the state as a dangerous Category 4. The governor issuing this blunt warning. Uh, the time to act is now. Uh, if you haven't acted, act to make preparations. Do not wait until it's too late. Residents in Davie packed this Costco, stocking up for days worth of food and supplies. Some stores not able to keep up with the demand. NASA isn't taking any chances either, moving hardware out of harm's way at Kennedy Space Center. Meanwhile, on the central coast where tourism is key, restaurants are struggling to fill seats on what would typically be a bustling Labor Day weekend. We've probably dropped 30, 40 percent business. The beach also thinned out. Really only like us and a few other people here. Two days ago, it was totally stacked. Vacationers cutting their holiday short. But the tourism is definitely going to be a little down this year. <laughs> but getting in and out of Florida may pose a problem. Pack a lot of patience. You may find long lines longer than you expected here uh, this weekend because people are trying to get out of town earlier. As all signs show Dorian settling in for the long weekend. And Port Canaveral is one of the busiest cruise ports in the world. And tonight, cruise lines are modifying itineraries for their guests to ensure their safety as Hurricane Dorian moves in. Kristen? Kathy Park, thank you for that report from Florida. And as Dorian barrels toward the U.S. mainland, we wanted to give you an idea of exactly what it's like to be inside a hurricane and feel those extremely powerful winds. NBC's Kristen Dahlgren with more on what could be in store when Dorian is expected to blast ashore. With all the talk of wind speeds and categories, the University of Maryland's research wind tunnel shows us what that really means. All right, we're in tropical storm force winds. This is too late to be boarding up your windows. By the time we hit hurricane strength at 74 miles an hour. And I can't walk against this anymore. Category one older mobile homes might be destroyed. We see some damage. We start to see a lot of power lines down. Even some stronger structures would see some roof damage. 96 miles an hour. We are now at category two strength. These winds are way too strong. I can barely lean into them anymore. Category two can bring damage to older structures, uprooted trees, and significant power outages. This is a category three now. For you, it's So that's as high as they let us go. Add in storm surge and a cat four or five can be catastrophic. But what researchers learn from tests here can be life saving. People think that they're prepared, but once the winds pick up, once the water, water rises, they're not as prepared as they think. A stark warning. <laughs> Time to get ready may quickly run out. Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News, College Park, Maryland. Tonight, Dorian's on a collision course with Florida and could be a Category 4 hurricane when it hits on Labor Day. The state of emergency is extended throughout the state. We're there as Florida prepares for the worst. Also tonight, officials in one city urge everyone to stop using e-cigarettes as cases of lung damage mount. A new report blasts fired FBI Director James Comey for violating FBI policies in his handling of memos about his conversations with the president. But he won't face charges. Severely ill immigrant children being treated in U.S. hospitals could be deported because of a change in policy by the Trump administration. Disturbing video, a woman in labor left alone for hours in a jail cell. No one came to her aid, now she's suing. Trouble at the palace, what's causing the Queen's guards to fall down on the job. And red light cameras save lives, so why are some cities banning them? This is the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. Good evening. Nora is off tonight. I'm John Dickerson. This is our Western edition.
Hurricane Dorian is now expected to hit even harder than previously thought, prompting a widened state of emergency in Florida. This evening, an emergency was declared also in Georgia. This ominous view from the space station shows the storm morphing into a monster over the Atlantic today. Dorian is now on track to make landfall early Monday, Labor Day, as a powerful category for hurricane. It could be the strongest direct hit to Florida's east coast since Hurricane Andrew in 1992. Late today, President Trump canceled a weekend visit to Poland to focus on the federal storm response. We turn now to Lonnie Quinn, chief weathercaster at WCBS in New York. Lonnie, what's the latest? Well, the latest is, you know, you just said that this could potentially be a top 10 storm in Florida throughout its history. Now, if you take a peek at the latest information from the National Hurricane Center, it's still a Category 1. The winds haven't changed, still 85 miles per hour. This is kind of key. It's moving to the northwest at 13 miles per hour. If that slows down, it can strengthen more. And that's all part of what we're watching. Number one, there is superheated water in front of this storm. You need water temperatures of 79 degrees to maintain a hurricane. If it's warmer than that, that storm can really grow. This water is going to travel over 85 to 90 degrees. All right, so this is why we think it's going to get much larger than it is. Also, that forward speed slows down. Right now, we just said, hey, it's moving at 13 miles per hour. By the time this gets close to affecting land, it's going to be moving at between 4 and 6 miles per hour. Again, the slower it moves, the more chance it gets to grow over that warm water and the longer that it affects a certain area. So inland flooding could be a big deal. If you take a peek at the high-pressure system that's going to steer this, we know it's going to push it towards the southeastern portion of the U.S. But exactly where? Is it going to make that turn? And this is why we are on alert from Savannah, Georgia, to the Keys of Florida, because look at the spaghetti models. I mean, they're all over the place. I want to point this out. This is the European model right here, having it coming into South Florida. But then it sort of buzzsaws right at the coastline, constantly pushing on shore. A storm surge, a big problem, a huge problem potentially with this storm. John, let's go over to you. Lonnie making it clear for us. Thank you, Lonnie. On Florida's Space Coast, the storm has prompted NASA to move its $650 million mobile rocket launcher into storage for safekeeping. Others are launching themselves towards stores and gas stations to stock up. David Begno is in Merritt Island, where folks are lining up for sandbags. David? John, the line to get sandbags has been close to a half mile today. People have been waiting. How long have you been here, ma'am? Since 11 a.m. this morning, one woman said she was here for eight hours. That's the pile of sand. Just when you get to the front, there's roughly 10 bags that the inmates from the county jail will fill for you, and then you are on your way. This is not the only line for sandbags in the county. There are several dozen. We actually got a time lapse today as we drove what seemed like 10 city blocks where people were stopped trying to get sandbags. Met a woman named Jamie. Her daughter, Mackenzie, a toddler, was in the back seat, had been there with mom for six hours in a car seat while she waited to get sandbags. Listen, up and down the state, it's not only sand people are trying to get, it's water, food, and fuel. There are lines outside of places like Costco, Sam's, and Walmart. Some stores are telling people you get four cases of water per family, that's it. The governor here in Florida has said there is a ton of fuel. We are seeing fuel lines, nothing really out of hand. Uh, speaking of the governor, he's declared a state of emergency for every single county in Florida, and he said today, I did that because the cone of uncertainty is so wide, we don't know if it's going to hit Miami or Jacksonville or somewhere in between. So he wants everybody ready to go. John, tonight, airlines are waving fees. If you're flying in or out, you can have your, your ticket canceled for free. There is a behemoth operation underway right now to prepare in the state of Florida. David Begno in Merritt Island. Thank you, David.